All right, today we are going to look at paired data. So first, let's look at this situation here. We have a researcher who is studying a random sample of identical twins who've been separated and adopted at birth. In each case, one twin, in this case twin A, was adopted by a high income family and the other twin, twin B, was adopted by a low income family. Both twins were given IQ tests as an adult. So here you can see we have the data for the 12 sets of twins and we have a dot plot for the IQ of the twins adopted by high income families and those adopted by low income families. So twins who were raised in high income households had a higher mean IQ of 109.5 versus the twins who were raised in a lower income family who had an average IQ of 103.667. So that doesn't seem like a big difference. And if you look at the amount of overlap between these two dot plots, it doesn't seem like there's really that much difference. But doing a two sample t-test for this situation is not the best method for comparing this data. Because what about some other factors like genetics that affect intelligence? So in this case, it would make more sense to use paired data. So in this case, we are going to take the twins who are identical the one who was raised in a high income family, the one who was raised in a low income fa family, who came from the same biological parents and pair them together. You can see here that pair one, even though twin A had a higher IQ than twin B, both of them had above average IQs. So pairing the data helps control for some variability that can be affected by other factors. So here we are really interested in the difference. In this case, we're doing twin A minus twin B to see um, the high income family or the twin who was raised by a high income family to see how much higher or lower their IQ was than their twin. So if we calculate the mean of the difference, that is 5.833 points, and the standard deviation of the difference is 3.93 points. And we have our dot plot here of the differences between twin A and twin B's IQ scores. And you can see both in the table and in the dot plot that there was only one situation where the twin raised in a lower income family had a higher IQ than the twin raised in a higher income family. So ultimately this study is helping us determine whether intelligence is, well, intelligence as measured by an IQ test is affected more by nature or nurture. That's the point of this study. So determining whether it is more appropriate to use paired data or a two sample t-test depends on how the data are produced. So if the data gives us two pieces of information from one individual, that would be a paired scenario. Um, or if there is a natural way to pair up two separate individuals. Um, in this case of the twins, that could also be a paired scenario. So when we are trying to analyze paired data, basically we are taking a two variable situation and converting it to a one variable situation by analyzing the difference of the two samples. So common notation that you will see is the subscript of diff 
or sometimes just the subscript D. So we want to look at whether music helps or hinders performance in math. So we have student researchers, Abigail, Carolyn, and Leah, who are designing an experiment using 30 student volunteers to find the answer. Each subject completes a 50 question single digit arithmetic test with and without playing music. For each subject, the order of the music and no music treatments was randomly assigned, and the time to complete the data in seconds was recorded for each treatment. So here is our data, including the difference. Ultimately, we want to take a look at the difference. That's what we're interested in. Does it take me more time to complete this arithmetic task with or without music? So first we can start off by calculating the difference, music minus without music, which is done for us, and making a dot plot. So then we want to try to determine whether music helps or hinders math performance. So since slightly more than half of the students took longer on the math task when they were listening to music, so 17 out of 30, um, took longer, meaning that they had a positive difference, there is some evidence that music actually hinders students when they are completing an arithmetic task. Now we can calculate the mean and standard deviation of the differences just like we do with any set of data. And we want to interpret the mean here. So this means the time that it took these 30 students to complete the arithmetic quiz with music was 2.8 seconds longer on average than the time it took them without music. So when you are trying to decide whether you should use a paired data situation or a two sample situation, the two primary ways that you know you need to use paired data is if you are recording two values from each individual, like we just discussed in this music example. Each person took the arithmetic quiz twice, once with music, once without, and you're comparing those. The other option is when there is a natural way to pair individuals, such as with the identical twins. You pair the individuals based on some um, characteristic that they have in common. It could be their genes, it could be their um, speed for running a 5k before you start some exercise regimen. It doesn't matter as long as there is a specific reason why you are pairing those two people together so that you can compare their results. So in terms of doing the math, a confidence interval for the mean of the difference is basically just a one sample t interval. We have all of the same conditions that we had for a one sample t interval. We have random condition, 10% condition, large normal sample. And the formula is basically the same as a one sample t interval. We have the mean of the difference plus or minus t star times the standard deviation of the difference over the square root of n. It is important to note that n is the number of pairs, not the total number of data points. And you use um, n minus one degrees of freedom. So let's go back to the twin example. We want to construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the true mean difference in IQ scores among twins raised in high income and low income households. We have the data here. Now we need to state, plan, do, conclude. So state, we are doing a 95% confidence interval for the mean of the difference, where mean of the difference is the true mean difference high income minus low income, and you do always want to specify which direction you are doing your subtraction. 
in IQ scores for pairs of identical twins raised in separate households. Plan, we are doing a one sample T interval for the mean of the difference. We had randomly selected sets of twins. It's probably true that 12 is less than 10% of all sets of identical twins raised in separate households. We have a small sample, so we do need to create a graph of the difference and make sure that it is not particularly skewed or has outliers. Do go ahead and do your calculations. You need the mean and standard deviation of the difference. And then you can plug that information into the formula to get your confidence interval. You can also do this on the calculator, which I will show you in a minute. We are 95% confident that the interval from 3.336 to 8.33 captures the true mean difference, high minus low, in IQ scores among pairs of identical twins raised in separate households. And because there is still a relationship between confidence intervals and hypothesis tests, this gives some evidence that there is a difference between the IQs of the twins raised in high income versus low income households, because zero is not included in this confidence interval. So let's look at how to do this on the calculator. So since we are given the raw data, it actually makes sense for us to just go ahead and type that into the list. Stat, edit, type in your raw data. And you can make the calculator calculate the difference for you. So if you go over to L3, and we want to do high minus low, which is L1 minus L2. So to get L1, you do second one, minus second two, hit enter, and then it fills in L3 with the difference between L1 and L2. You just have to make sure that you copy the data carefully and keep it in order. Now we can go to stat tests, and we are doing a one sample T interval, which is number eight on my calculator. I'm going to say that I want to use data because I have typed data into the list and I want it to do my confidence interval based on the data that's in L3. We have a 95% confidence interval, so I'm going to change that and then calculate. All right, and we get 3.338 to 3.3287, which is a tiny bit different than the answer we had on the slide, but that it's so close that it's just due to rounding. Now let's take a look at hypothesis tests or significance tests. So you will hear this called a paired t-test frequently. Typically, our null hypothesis will be that the mean of the difference is zero, meaning that there's no difference. And we have the same conditions that we had for the confidence interval. The procedure here is basically the same as a one sample t-test that we discussed in the previous lesson. You calculate your test statistic, which is t, by doing the sample mean of the difference minus zero or whatever values in your null hypothesis, divided by the standard deviation of the difference over the square root of n. And again, n is the number of pairs. So we will use n minus one degrees of freedom. So researchers designed an experiment to study the effects of caffeine withdrawal. They recruited 11 volunteers who were diagnosed as being caffeine dependent to serve as subjects. Each subject was barred from caffeine, soda, and other substances with caffeine, or coffee, soda, and other substances with caffeine for the duration of the experiment. During one two-day period, subjects took capsules containing their normal caffeine intake. During another two-day period, they took placebos. 
in order or the order in which they took the pills was randomized and at the end of each two-day period a test for depression was given to all 11 subjects researchers wanted to know whether being deprived of caffeine would lead to an increase in depression so we have our table here that gives us the data of their depression test scores now i don't know how you quantified depression that is a question for the psychologists I don't know what kind of tests they gave them to quantify their depression. So we want to know if this data provides significant evidence at the alpha equals 0 0.05 significance level that caffeine withdrawal increases depression score on average for subjects like the one, like the one in this, this experiment. So again, we need to state, plan, do, conclude. So state our null hypothesis is going to be that the mean of the difference is zero. Our alternative hypothesis is that the mean of the difference is greater than zero because we want to know if caffeine withdrawal increases the depression score. And we're going to define the mean of the difference as the true mean difference placebo minus caffeine in depression test scores for subjects like these. And we're going to go ahead and use uh, 0 0.05 as our alpha value. Plan. We are doing a paired t-test for the mean of the difference. We have randomly selected or randomly assigned the uh, treatments or the order of the treatments to the subjects. We do not need to check the 10% condition because we're doing an experiment. And we have a small sample size, so we need to go ahead and graph our um, difference and make sure that that distribution is not strongly skewed and doesn't have outliers. For do, we need the mean and standard deviation of the differences. We can calculate our t value, which is 3.53, and then either use the table or technology to calculate our p value. And again, you can do this in the calculator, which I will show you in a minute. So because we ended up with a p value of 0. 0027, which is less than our alpha value of 0 0.05, we are going to reject our null hypothesis. We have convincing evidence that caffeine withdrawal increases depression test score on average for subjects like the one in our experiment. Let's take a look at the calculator. Again, if we go to stat, edit, you can type in your data. My first column is caffeine, the second column is placebo, and I can make the calculator calculate the difference. In this case, I want to do placebo minus caffeine. So L2 minus L1. Then I want to run a significance test on L3. So if I go to stat, test, and I want a T test, which is number two, I want to use data. And I'm going to use L3 for my data. The value in my null hypothesis was zero, so I'm gonna leave that as zero. And my alternative hypothesis was greater than. So when I calculate, I get my test statistic as 3.53, my p-value as 0 0.0027. And then you can draw your conclusions from there. Again, if you are trying to determine whether you should use a two-sample procedure or paired procedure, you need to pay attention to how the data were produced. If you have random samples from two populations or from uh, two groups in an experiment, you want to use the two-sample T procedure that we talked about in the previous video. If your data either gives you two measurements from the same individual or you can pair individuals based on a specific characteristic then you would have a paired t-test so let's look at a couple scenarios and just try to decide which method we are using so before exiting the water scuba divers remove their fins a maker of scuba equipment advertises a new style of fins that's supposed to be faster to remove a consumer advocacy group suspects that the time to remove the new fins may be no different than the time required to remove the old fins, 
on average. 20 experienced scuba divers are recruited to test the new fins. Each diver flips a coin to determine if they wear the new fin on the left foot and the old fin on the right foot or vice versa. They time how long it takes each diver to remove each fin. This is going to be a paired t-test because you are getting two measurements from each individual. So if I am a scuba diver, I am giving you how long it took you took me to remove the new fin and the time it took me to remove the old fin. So that will be a paired situation. Next scenario. To study the health of aquatic life, scientists gathered a random sample of 60 white piranha fish from a tributary of the Amazon River during one year. The average length of the fish was compared to a random sample of 82 white piranha from the same tributary a decade ago. This is going to be a two sample t-test because these are two separate independent random samples of white piranhas from two different years. There is no way you can pair them together. And lastly, can a wetsuit deter shark attacks? A researcher has designed a new wetsuit with color variations that are suspected to deter shark attacks. To test this idea, she feels, fills two identical drums with bait and covers one in the standard black neoprene wetsuit and the other in the new suit. Over a period of one week, she selects 16 two-hour time periods and randomly assigns eight of them to the drum in the black wetsuit. The other eight are assigned the new suit. During each time period, the appropriate drum is submerged in waters that sharks frequent, and the number of times a shark bites the drum is recorded. Again, this is going to be a two-sample t-test because we have two groups in a randomized experiment. You are taking the times and randomly selecting which um, wetsuit covered drum should be submerged at that time. So this is a an experiment with two groups not a paired situation. And that is it for paired data.